Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my lecture that goes on almost 25 hours late since of the 25, 24 and a half were had an internet problem in my village here in the whole area and that's why I could not do it yesterday. Um, my topic is mixed integer or it shall be a co combinatorial stochastic programming. And I decided to give a lecture that is pretty twofold. We have a mixed integer branch and we have a PDE branch. Uh, and I will show that I say both disciplines are now mature in their connections also in stochastic programming to offer interesting research and some first results are already there. Before, first of all, I'd like to thank you Montreal people. That is not only since yesterday, I had it before yesterday on. Since it, I look, look, then I look back, I saw that I had so many people from Montreal in my scientific life. And the first one might be surprising, uh, as Sanjo Slobek, Slobets. It was in 1986 in parametric optimization and related topics in Plauer, a conference that was organized by my former boss, Jürgen Goddard at uh, Humboldt University. And I was the, the, uh, yeah, the scientist, this is his official assistant for this conference. Then uh, another person that came very early was Jean-Louis Goffin, who sent me to the optimization days in 1996. And then a whole, Bunch of people came. Michel Gendreau. Michel Gendreau, uh, I met him at so many places in the world, uh, sometimes in Montreal, sometimes in Montevideo, some, I think also in, in, in Germany, everywhere. So I have very nice uh, relations. We had very nice, very interesting connection. Theo Kreinich, I remember very well. Miguel Andros, Eric Delage, Walter Ray. And what I, have in, what I have in mind is um, my first IEEE conference was in Montreal. My, uh, I had a very nice, we had a very nice uh, meeting on stochastic programming in the Benz Center, I think in 2009 or so. And then my IFRS distinguished lecture that I was able to present in Montreal, which was a big, big honor to me. So now let's come to the, uh, mathematical issues here. I say, let's say, I, I, I claim that this is now about multi-stage stochastic integer proof. Numerical computation rests on two pillars. Uh, in the end, we do two things. We either calculate solutions of systems of linear equations, or we calculate the greatest common divisor of two integers. My talk will basically go with the second one, with, the, with, the, with calculating the greatest common divisors. Why? Because I think that the potential offered by discrete mathematics for solving stochastic integer programs is widely underexploited. Here we have this uh, typical example. It was called Bob's Headache. It goes back to a coll collaboration with Martin van der Flerk and Lane Stalpy. And I'll explain in a moment what was Bob's Headache. Uh, this is a function on, a, on two variables. It is the outcome of a, a mixed integer recourse function in a two stage a stochastic integer programming. And the maximum of this function, somewhere there in the red, dark red area, and on top it is really, uh, uh, I think it is four, four federal, at, at least so. This is a very uh, an awful function, and it, it can be constructed by the mechanisms that are given by the classic integer programming. We have a two-stage planning problem with a bi knapsack second stage and a random budget. We have a random budget. We have a, you can spend the budget either in the first stage or in the second stage. And in the second stage, we have uh, the, the, the residual budget. This goes into a bi knapsack problem and has to uh, go accordingly. That gives this uh, the two-stage model. It gives this uh, presentation here. Uh, we have four second-stage variables: y one, y two, y three, y four, and we have two first-stage variables: uh, x one and x two, or yeah, or t one x, t one two, yeah. And uh, yeah, we have we have we have five. We have five five first-stage variables: six, 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 
zero bar R6. No, well, no, we have two. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. We have two variables, and they go in the end. They can take if each can six can take six values. We can have we have thirty six feasible values in the first stage only. And when we do this, write this as a uh, as a block structured mixed integer linear program, and feed it to CPLEX. And that was the headache that was at that time. And uh, CPLEX was not able yet to dis discover this structure that's in there. It, namely, if you have these thirty six feasible points. You put uh, x on all, each of these 36 values. You do 36 uh, separate calculations of a, uh, of a small of 441 each uh, by knapsack problems in, dim in dimension four. And this is all very, very doable at that time. But in an all at once with, uh, with the CPLEX, it was not possible. While we had a problem at that, uh, we had, at that time, uh, we had a uh, was about 95, 94, 96, 1996. Um, we had this Gerkner basis approach where we were able to solve it, of course, uh, in a pretty uh, short time. And I'll show you what was the essence at that time. I'll, at that time, in the beginning, that this is the beginning of algebraic methods in integer programming. We had an integer LP and Quantian Traverso in 1991. They translated this into a sub algebra membership problem. It sounds mighty, but it is algebra is a pretty, pretty uh, direct algebra. The idea is that if you have the, equa the equ equation system A xi equal B, then you can put this as, as a power of a uh, basis X. And an X to the B is X to the AE. And then if you um, apply the, the, the laws for, for, for calculating those powers, then you see that it is X some a i x i i and this is the product of the x of the xi i a x a i to the power xi i so it is a member of this uh set of uh combinations linear combinations of these uh, monomials here so b is feasible if and only if x b is a member of this uh, sub algebra and that this leads to the following uh, set, uh, setup we have uh, n, many uh, polynomials, and we adopt a monomial order. So polynomials, multivariate polynomials, are sums of power products. A power product is a, a power product of variables is x1 to the a1, so to x2 to the b2, and so on. And we have a, um, we, we have a, and we have to adopt for these powers or for, for the vectors, vector powers, we have to adopt uh, an order, monomial order that gives, uh, yeah, brings some order in these, into these monomials. Monomials are identified with the vectors of their exponents. And then we form an ideal, an ideal, the ideal is the, uh, Sum of uh, the set of all polynomial uh, linear combinations of the elements in the generating set here f1 minus y1, fn minus yn, and g, let the group be a group in the basis of it. I'll tell you in a moment what that is. And the sub algebra membership then is that uh, you, you belong, you, you, are, you, are, you, are in the, you are in the successful part when you have a, uh, when the residual upon dividing. Your polynomial uh, by this uh, set of f1 to fn is um, zero. This means that g is x b is, uh, is generated by binomials. The remainder is a monomial. Uh, just to give you a feeling of what this is about, this leads to a to, to something that has to do with um, dividing polynomials. I only want to show you how dividing of polynomials is uh, doing the job here. In this, and if we, before we look at the dividing division of polynomials, let's have a look at the division. In at the last line here in the, in the slide, the division is a type of reduction. Here we have the division that you know from school, from elementary school. You have the number, number h and number g, and h is bigger than g. And if you divide, and you divide h by g yielding a remainder 
gamma here. What is divide? What is division? Division is you subtract of, of the of the divisor. You, you you subtract the maximum multiple of the divisor from the the dividend in the first. So you, you just you subtract. So if h h h is equal n times g, then you have n times divided uh, subtracted the g from h. And this leaves you a remainder of, of gamma then. And to this division, you replace the division now by the polynomial division that you uh, that, that is sometimes taught in high school, sometimes taught in, in university courses, I'm not sure. And uh, then you um, you have this such a division procedure that allows you in the end to decide whether your vector is optimal or not. So the bibliographical background for this is the early activities, this so-called outcome in the moment, these test set methods, is that uh, in Bu uh, Conti and Traverso, that was the one that I, in 1991 already, uh, and then Rekha Thomas, at, now at the University of Washington, Seattle, she has an, uh, she gave a talk in Berlin in 1995, if I'm not mistaken, an interior point method for integer programs. And uh, she, you don't know that the word interior point, the term interior point is already somehow given, but the idea was that the integer program is solved by searching into in, across the interior. And this was uh, precisely this quanti traverso approach. And uh, with Lane Stauffer and Martin van der Flap, we took this to stochastic programming and had the idea that we have a two-stage integer program. And for a fixed first stage, we have to be able to solve the many second stage problems that arrive when the different first stage uh, uh, iterations and uh, uh, realizations of the random variables. So we, the idea is that we have as many, many to solve. And the, the, the major effect here in this, using these Gerbner bases was that once we had these Gerbner bases, we could these divisions to obtain the, the Gerbner bases, we did, did that had to do a, a number, a big number of such divisions. But now, once we had it and the new right hand side came in, only one division was doing the job. And that's why we could be speed up by exhaustive enumeration, if you wish. And this led to uh, Raymond Hemmeke, my, my, my doctoral student at that time, to think about it. And he came up with a decomposition approach of SS, and I'll come back to this later on. More recent activities, we found this. He has a, uh, and Raymond then did some extension with Matthias Aschenbrenner to multi stage stochastic integer programs. And there is, in the meantime, there's a book by Delora, Jesus Delora, Raymond Hemmick, and Matthias Köppe, where this is embedded in, the, in today's yeah, considerations. What is this? Uh, test set is primal augmentation about. We want to solve an optimization problem, minimum f of x, x element. And the claim is now that in, certain, in some situations, we have a finite set B containing improving vectors, if there are any. So either improving means either there exists a B in B, such that xn plus one uh, that, uh, that arises from, from xn, by adding b, is feasible, belongs to x, and has a smaller uh, function value, then we accept this as the next iterate. If not, then we know that x, the current iterate, is optimal. Um, this, <coughs> has, uh, this is a, not called primal augmentation. Uh, and we will see what the, what the inner reasons are that this things are such um, Objects really exist, but before let's see what would be the issues then when doing uh, stochastic programming with these things. We have the uh, we need a set that we operate in. We operate with the X, the X capital X is an operating set, and we need a we need to have a partial order 
in this set. You can see this in a moment. And then we have relations. The exist, and then what, what is an anti chain? If you have a partial order, a partially ordered set, reflexive, transitive order relation, then uh, uh, as long as it is a partial order, you do not have the complete comparability of, of, the, of, of all the members. You will always have members that are not comparable. And uh, you have now structures where you cannot find uh, infinitely many uh, smaller, in, in, where, where, where you cannot find infinitely many uh, pairs that are not in a relation. And the uh, Euclidean end space with, uh, with and, and, and considered to the con constraint to the integers is such. And this was then, and this, uh, and this allows you to compute this basis, I will show you in a moment. And the SP, for SP is the issue for SP is that you are allowed, once you have accumulated all this knowledge, you are allowed to work scenario. You can solve mixed integer, two stage, even multi-stage problems by, 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 by working scenario wise. And this has been done by a group of them work early algebraic work from the previous century. Paul Gordon, Dixon, Megalagan, and Action Brenner Hamilton navigating in the interior of the field of set. How is this to be accomplished? Here are the people. This is here the picture that I mean. With this fine R2, take the integer points in R2. And you take component wise, you uh, the, the partial order. Then you can, if you have given a, a subset, you will find, you never find infinitely many of these points that have this, are this middle points. You only have finitely many. And this finiteness is uh, to, exploit it, to be exploited for the. Uh, finally, break manipulation that I'm showing to you in the next slides. So, in integer program, what were you doing? What were you doing in integer? I mean, we have as a ground set the, that Zn. We have a partial order on Zn as this, that is defined as follows. So, we take, we consider each orphan. That means we can, can, take, can take any set that arises by. All sets, members given like uj, uj, vj components. Um, and for each, in each author, we consider a uh, smaller, the usual relation. Then it's clear when we go in the, in the author, in each author, they are comparable. And we have such a relation that uh, yeah, u is less than v if u is component wise less than v in the same author. Commonly says that the set is, then the set u reduces v. U reduces v. Yeah, this reduction. You, you remember this from from the from the high, from from the elementary school division. You subtract, you subtract as long as you can. And uh, the set B uh, then uh, is in just in a moment. I'll tell you what the set B. Before is this uh, here this. Uh, uh, anti-chain notion, I think. Yeah, if you, the sequence of vectors in Zn plus, or you can think of this as vectors in Zn plus, or also as uh, monomial exponents, the exponent vectors of monomial. Of monomial. And uh, if they are, if they are not pairwise comparable, then they are called an anti-chain. And in Zn plus, with less than equal, this relation, there are no anti-chains of infinite cardinality. That's the, the Gordon Dixon lemma. Here in the picture. Again, yeah. <clears throat> Every infinite set in Zn plus, but only finitely many 
minimal points with respect to this uh, relation. And now about the set B, Jack Graver, he gave the first example for, for a, such a uh, set in, for an integer program. If you have an integer program with uh, matrix A, AX equal B, then um, he said that the set of all minimal points with, with respect to this uh, orthodwise, orthodwise partial order, that all these points, set of all points of the set, uh, the kernel of the kernel of the matrix, my theory, is called a grave replacement. And why does it make sense to work with this? Uh, this comes out to, this brings us to augmentation, to this augmentation algorithm. So this set, this graver basis, or this is now called the test set, no, it's the test set. And it's called an optimality certificate or a test set for the family of integer linear programs. If precisely this happens, what I already mentioned before, we have uh, a right-hand side, AZ equal B, a right-hand side B arrives. And uh, we have that minimization problem. We, if we see that um, for this uh, objective function, um, CT is always does never does never decrease for all the T and TC. Uh, we have only strictly bigger uh, values, uh, objective function values. And for every B and for every non-optimal feasible solution, there exists an improving vector such that Z, no, Z minus T is feasible. So if we go from, if, if you find a vector and we add with the current iter to Z zero, then we go there. Obviously, T must be a subset of the kernel of A. That's now, now if we have a, if, if we add something, if we add, if we add, a vector t yeah, uh, such that uh, a z equals b and a z plus t equals b yeah, and a t equals zero, then t is in the kernel of a. That's where the kernel of a comes from in the, in the graver basis. The method says, is, okay, go to the intersections of this kernel with the orphans and study these uh, test sets so that these uh, vectors in there. I did not yet tell how to compute them, but we have a, a first imagination of what to look for. Yeah, and this graver basis A, this set of all uh, minimal points in the individual orphans of this, uh, with respect to this relation is called the uh, is graver set, and the graver set is a test set and can be computed by a finite algorithm. That's the, that's the big message here. And the, um, the computation is the following. Why, how, how, why does it, how does it work? We have a normal form procedure. And normal form procedure is while there is some G that is smaller than S, then reduce and go to G. And this is the division with remainder. And the completion algorithm of this, which I come in the next slide, this one yields a set which contains the graver set. So let's see what this completion is. That's the following. So we have this, uh, we have AZ equal B, AZ equal B. And we have a, uh, assume that we are a set of vectors that generate the kernel of A over Z. The output is a set G, which contains the IP graver set. How does this work? We what we do is we are forming so-called S vectors, suited G vectors, uh, which we obtain by um, taking from our from the from the set we, that we want. We have a set that we want to reduce them down to a Bergner uh, basis or basis set here, and we have a mm, and the, the crucial operation is that. We take an S, an element, and then we do the normal form 
uh, operation. That means this is uh, subtraction with division uh, with respect to G, to G. And if the residue, the residue at the end is non-zero, then we add and add all the, we add this to all the members. And if it is, if it is zero, yeah, S-axis, and if it and, and then we return G and go back. If, if this is zero, we are, have a group group base, and it's still um, we go back to the next element, pick it, reduce it. So the bus algorithm terminates with a set G containing the IP graver set. Uh, just to get you the feeling for the why does this terminate? With this normal form, when we have the normal form, then we can show that if there's a normal form, that there's, if there's, if we have a normal form solution, that means the end of the division, then we have no, uh, then there's no smaller uh, G, no smaller actually. If F is a normal form of all S with respect to some set capital G, then there is no G that such that G plus G minus that they, that they are lesser equal than the one that's given by F. Hence, the G plus G minus, they are incomparable with any U element G, and that is incomparable uh, in case. Uh, in case the algorithm does not terminate, an infinite number of normal form computations occurs. That's okay. In other words, there exists an infinite sequence in n to the two n such that the non relationship condition is fulfilled. Um, this, however, contradicts the Borland Dixon lemma, hence the algorithm terminates. Borland Dixon says that it's just one. Uh, finitely general. Yeah, and solving the IPs by uh, by augmentation is now this method that I already showed you, augmentation method. And how does this now all, how does all this relate? What happens when we are in stochastic integer program? I consider the following pure integer program. The um, Situation is so that uh, we remember that we are looking after uh, for, a, for a graver set, and the graver set has it, has it fulfills uh, that it comes from the kernel of the current system matrix, which is here the A n. We will later we will come, we will enlarge the dimensions. That's why we put an n here already, and this is what we will change. And so we we have a yeah, a number of scenarios and the parameters. Yeah, and the lemma is now the simple observation. If we have two objects, or if they are in the kernel, yeah, if you look at this kernel, if you look at the kernel of this matrix AN, and we see it repeats here. The T or the TW repeats. So we can we conclude that we have a and we conclude that if we have such a structure, mu is the, the vector part belonging to X, to the, to the, to the X variable, right? And the second stage is V1 to Vn. The, the shifts that we do with all these. these uh, vectors there, and uh, they are in the kernel, they hold the full vector in the kernel of the full matrix, if and only if. All individual vectors are members of the individual kernel. Just, uh, and so this is the basic for coming down from, from the big uh, matrix kernel AN, kernel AN to the smaller scenario S. Lemma, yeah.
Ja, das ist die Weiße. Dabei bemüht ihn die Dumas, die Sicano. Und das ist ein Graver Set. Like this transformed into a graver test set by such a permutation. This leads us to the following definition. 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 If we consider Z, which is the U part for the, for the, uh, for the X, uh, uh, we have we have this is uh, staircase matrix here, this block structure matrix again. Yeah. Here, yeah. And U is the, the, the first uh, concerns the first uh, column. And the Y concerns the re 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 remaining columns there. And they have a, yeah. And if we, we call the vectors the building blocks of that, they were, note that the N, the graded test set associated with AN and collect to H and all those vectors arising as building blocks of some Z in the GN. By H infinity, we have the such super super set where all these improving directions are in. Yeah, yeah and one can show that this uh, set of improving vectors is finite, and uh, this is done. Uh, Oh, really. An analogous consideration, however, with a more abstract structure. We say that we have a, we have a first stage vector and a second stage set. We have two of these objects, objects, and we compare them. They are comparable. Uh, if the first stages are in some relation, they are then no longer compare. Uh, this, but they were, uh, um, yeah, this is the, 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 the question is now whether we have these building blocks available or doing the reduction in this uh, Buchberger type algorithm. And the answer is yes, we can define properly what this means, and then we can work there on this. Uh, scenario level. We associate with every U, V, U, uh, and, and, and we have, and now we go to two monomial ideals uh, that they, they are forming only in the reasoning. Yeah, we don't have to go there, see them explicitly. And we, uh, yeah, remember an ideal is a subset of a polynomial ring. Oh, that it, that so that zero belongs to it, zero, and that uh, uh, two members, the sum, the sum of the and uh, the and the uh, multiples with any member from the from the base. Yeah. yeah. Theorem. Now there comes something that looks similar to what we had seen before in the integer world. Now in the integer world, we had considered sequences of numbers. Now we look at sequences of monomial ideals in the polynomial ring. And she showed that there is an infinite collection of monomial ideals. And you always find two of them, which are in a relation I belongs to J, so that uh, yeah, so that you cannot mm. of those you only have finitely many, so you cannot have an infinite number of monomial ideals uh, in a in a polyhedron. Yeah. The computation. Uh, we retain a completion pattern, uh, 
the Bravest Head computation. And then we define two main ingredients, the S vectors. That means the, the, the vectors that have to be formed in the algorithm. And then the, the way they have to be divided. We define their division. And this is a, a, yeah. And we, with the, these specifications that are listed here, we get uh, a normal form algorithm that we define in this way. And uh, and this allows us, in the end, to work uh, scenario one. Some more. Uh, describe the sets of linear multi-stage stochastic integer program a decomposition into finitely many building blocks independently on the number of scenarios and the completion type of algorithm for computing grave sets is the same there and it goes back by the for it uses essentially the theory of better quasi ordering by mr nash williams he was so and uh, this was done by matthias aschenbrenner and uh, Raymond Hamicke, and they have this, uh, and it's, uh, the paper is there, but that's the state of the art now. We have this decision, or the, and we know the, the finite convergence, and uh, uh, it has not picked up yet again. And I think it may, may have maybe worth looking into this again. And down with the many new uh, ideas that have come over graph theory, of over scenario trees and so Maybe something gives us a possibility to compute um, yeah, solutions to multi-stage mixed integer program, integer program, multi-stage integer program, uh, using these uh, more advanced uh, techniques here, for which now also much faster hardware is available, of course, when we compare from this one. And this was 15 years ago when they had their paper. Yeah, thank you for your attention. So far, I've, after a short break, I will switch completely. I will come from the discrete world to the infinite, to the infinite dimensional. And I hope this is still enlightening. Thank you. Guten Abend. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen here from Germany. It's the day after my lecture. Uh, it's now uh, six o'clock, so I'm, I'm two and a half hours late. And I'll come with a second topic that is completely antipodal, I would say, to, to, to mixed integer linear problems. It is as continuous as it could be and as dimensional as it could be. It is PDE constraint. So we will consider news vendors that shall give a hint on the classic programming that we are doing in unexplored territories. ODE, not that much, PDE, DFG. DFG is our National Science Foundation. It sounded so nicely put it in there. Uh, so here we go. We have news from stochastic shape optimization. First, most of the work is done with Sergio Conti and Martin Rump and with further students that will come in a moment here. Um, what's the topic? So in stochastic programming, we have the following situation. In two-stage stochastic programming, we have a first stage decision, a random observation, an optimal second stage decision. Together producing a vector f or number f that assigns to the first stage decision x and the observation of the random variable assigns a number, a random number, f of x and omega. Having to take it to take the uh, decision non-anticipatively, um, we have to find an x. Uh, such that these f of x omega, which in some sense are random variables, measure, measurable functions, is as good as, 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 as possible. As possible. We have seen in uh, two-stage stochastic programming, we have seen risk aversion as an important topic. And the risk aversion in the constraints, in the objective. And then in the objective, we had ranking these numbers f of x of omega by application of risk measures. 
We have risk aversion in the constraints you have seen. With a random benchmark, you consider only those for the further uh, optimization that are comparing well. That means I have a certain position with respect to the dominance relation. Today, I will do uh, yeah, le dernier cri, if my French is fine, uh, pessimistic by level. Uh, the unlucky, that means uh, we have not two stages, we have by level, that means the unlucky takes another round upon building f of x omega. We come back. And this is PD constraints to classic programs for shape optimization under random loading. Let us, uh, let me uh, uh, first. Uh, recall some facts, and then I'll come to a recent, very recent paper that we produced recently, uh, just last week or finished it last week. And this is a, a bi-level, a pessimistic bi-level shape optimization problem, PD constraint problem. So shape optimization in the deterministic sense means that geometry is a variable. Yeah, we have, we, we consider elastic shape optimization, elastic of, of elastic body, so an elastic body represented by an open bounded set in R2 or R3 is subjected to volume forces and surface loads, leading to leading to uh, deformation. Deformation, yeah? deformation, displacement is formalized by the solution of partial differential equations. That's where the partial differential equations come in. The objective is to find a shape that minimizes a certain functional of the deformation under the given loading condition. With deterministic forces, this is an established field in theory analysis, solution methods, numerics, and computations engineering. The acting forces are not known in advance. That's the problem, and they vary stochastically. Therefore, one has to decide on the shape before observing the actual forces. And one is in at home in stochastic programming. Uh, we decide according to, but one, but to what to what criteria? To what kind of criteria do you decide? And a surprisingly slim body of research is done in this in the stochastic case. Yeah, the deformation a bit more formal to come formalized to bring in to see show at least once the PDE that's in. Yeah, we have the we have a, a, the forces deform the body. Uh, and from a point X becomes X plus UX and the deformed body. I mean, and the displacements, we assume that the displacements are sufficiently smooth and small. And this means uh, leads to linearized elasticity. And linearized elasticity is the, is, the field, is the field where we borrow now concepts from linear to stage stochastic uh, optimization. Elasticity PDE. Yeah, here. It comes a divergence of the sum of the partial derivatives. Let me just write it. I just write it, show it to you. This is the background, which I'll just, we should only know this is an object where a function is uh, the result. Look for a function. The conditions are given in partial differential, uh, partial derivatives. We have uh, certain conditions on the boundary and numerical analysis are doing this and theoretical analysis basic they ensure that the, the solutions exist here. We have random entities now. We consider we have this, such a PDE, where as we see, where we see the the F and the OG, they are the right hand sides. They get they come they are random, and the O, the that's a shape optimization. Yeah, the O here, the the uh, the O is the uh, so, so what you look for, elastic body. And what is the criterion? Well, what, what, what shall be? If we have a deformation, we want to have that the body resists deformation. And resists deformations or minimizes uh, compliance with it. Yeah? And this leads to the objective function theory. In this random entities for optimization now, and we, they all can be expressed in such a looks Maybe it looks and you will, uh, integrals, yeah. We have here we have a uh, volume integral first, surface integral, and some regularization. The regularization term here, the length, yeah, the bound the bound length, uh, is a typical issue because uh, uh, regarding the uh, uh, 
uh, existence of solutions, you can have uh, such small, tiny improvements by, by making a small change in the, in, the, in the functions that you have in there. And to prevent this, uh, uh, you do this uh, length requirement and that the length of the length is bounded, then this cannot do it forever. It's becoming more and more and more, and more uh, frequency and changing. Yeah. It can be all, there are reasonable assumptions that all the solution has a unique solution shape. And the third term is a regularization with a constant parameter. Then assume that they are linear or quadratic and independent of omega. The integrants are independent of omega. And uh, yeah, we'll see all this. This is no big this is an example. Uh, the compliance, as I said, the compliance to the, that means we want to be we want to follow as little as possible the power, the forces that are attacked. That are attacked. And this gives, gives a linear function. It's a linear integral, and both for the volume and the surface integral. And uh, second that we will see today in our expert, in our paper, we'll see is the tracking. Tracking, they, and tracking functions are very popular in PV. Tracking it means you you have a you minimize the square distance with to, to an object. Here, when we look for a, for a deformation, you have a give a, give a desired deformation and want to go drift away as little as possible from that that deformation. And then this comes together, and now we are then we are come here yeah, now our functions come. Now you yeah, now this jet. J of O and omega. The first stage, remember the two, two stage stochastic programming. Uh, the first stage decision, now it's not X, it's O. The yeah, realization, omega, they give you a number. And uh, yeah, and this number is again admissible, admissible regions. Yeah, so. And you can now rank these numbers, taking expectations with local mode, taking like risk aversion, like with uh, risk measure, taking risk measure. I clear the uh, expected excess over some previous time. And uh, all the excess probability. I'll just, just show you again that how these, these pictures from, from, from standard stochastic programming reappear here. And, and each time I gave that much uh, substance that we could have nice uh, investigations on this and have really nice pictures, papers. Uh, yeah, do stage stochastic programming, where is the second stage? Is the question. And then become this comes to the weak formulation equivalent variational problems. So the PDE solution is characterized by the minimizer of the elastic energy, and that's sometimes how we also solve the PDE. We solve it, so what we in fact also doing now in this paper. Yeah. We minimize the elastic energy, and then we get a dual information. And uh, yeah. yeah, and in computations uh, we. They all follow the forces, the acting forces, they follow finite discrete probability distribution. This is already rich enough to produce quite nice impacts there. Since both the elasticity PDE and its adjoint, I didn't show the adjoint, but they are linear with respect to, to U and P. The PDE solution can be broken down to small number of basis forces. So that's a, that means. Uh, if F and G arise as linear combinations of basic forces, and when they are written in this way, then you can evaluate the objective function for a given shape. One only needs to solve as many elasticity PDEs as there are basis forces and not as there are scenarios. Like here, you can again have this is your paper, your, your, uh, PDE. And suppose that you have these uh, elastic displacement for given volume forces in surface loads. Mm -hmm. Simulate the displacement corresponding to the volume for. Then the solution to the big problem is as a linear combination of the solution of the smaller ones. That's an essential, that's an essential short. Yeah, and this is now the this is the this is the situation. So we have we have experience in, in, in constructing function nodes and the, we decide non anticipatory shape optimization. We have to decide on the shape before we know the randomness comes in. 
And this is now the more recent paper that we have a pessimistic bilevel stochastic program problem for elastic shape optimization that is uh, under review and the second review, the revision is under review. It's together with uh, Johanna Bochild and Matthias Klaus from, from Duisburg, Joshua Sassen from Bonn, as Sergio Conti and Martin Lowe to Google Zahn. And you see it's supported by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, DFG, um, via collaborative research centers, two, one, one in Bonn and one in uh, where we are involved in here. Uh, Bonn colleagues are involved in Bonn, we are involved in the TRR the, and the uh, collaborative research center devoted to optimization and gas network. And it's located at the Erlangen University with Alexander Martin as the uh, chairman, speaker. So, yeah, the problem. What's the problem? Mechanical shape optimization problem. I first uh, describe the deterministic problem and then we come to stochastic and then I'll show you some solutions. Where the leader decides on an optimal material distribution to minimize a tracking type cost. Yes, it's like, for example, you are you're producing some, some, some piece and you uh, decide on what material you distribute in this and uh, you have a given, uh, some, 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 some optimum, some, 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 some desirable, some desirable outcome, and you track this desirable outcome. You see, you see that the picture is there. The follower, however, chooses forces from an admissible set to maximize a compliance object. To maximize compliance, that means you produce, and then that is the, the, the proof engineer looking for the nastiest force that could work to uh, deteriorate your performance as much as possible. And so the, the follower chooses forces from an admissible set to maximize the compliance in the compliance. So tracking objective in the first, compliance objective in the second, we've seen both before. The material distribution is considered to be stochastically perturbed in the actual construction. That's now, now comes the stochastic. So we, 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 we Decide, but we know we cannot reach these, uh, these values, but because uh, there are influence, random influences in while production running that we cannot exclude. The class of pessimistic bilevel stochastic programs is now uh, arise this way, where the lower level problem has a strictly convex quadratic objective function and the fixed feasible set. That's where we come up with. And the pessimistic bilevel problem now looks at this. So it's uh, to, you have to minimize some functional phi of u, which is, which itself is a maximum of a parametric optimization problem. So we, we have a, uh, uh, yeah. and the u is a non empty closed set. Uh, J is the cost functional of the leader, which we assume to be continuous. In our application, this will be a tracking type projection for a discrete shell uh, with thickness, stiffness, parameters u in an admissible set u and applied force. So we consider shells. So the objects that we produce are shells. And uh, we uh, uh, scenarios and shells that have to withstand certain forces. Uh, the forces, the forces scenarios now are tested and are combined in such a way that we really have to. Uh, most disadvantages outcome there. And uh, that means we, uh, yeah, we have, we are in the situation that we've seen there with the, with the uh, pessimistic uh, by level model. And we let the lower level solution set mapping be given by such an arc max. We, the above hierarchical problem that can be understood as a three level problem. However, the third level is symmetric and positive definite for any admissible material parameter. So the third level problem is uniquely solvable and is invoking by the optimality conditions we obtain the explicit reformulation of the station that we put in. So if you, if you look into the second uh, stage model here with this one and uh, have a simple expression with the lower level value function here. Now we come in the definition of the second level here. The forces that are equal to this uh, 
the value here. And the, however, motivation for regularization, this is now, if, we, if you take these, these models, as, as far as also, you see, you have to do with lower semi-continuous functions, not even that close. This continuity, you want to exclude from the numerical considerations. This continuity, we have so far very little uh, assumptions here. And the motivation is that this phi arises as the objective function of a pessimistic bilevel problem, where the lower level problem may have more than a single optimal solution, so locals, yeah, can thus not be expected to be lower than it continues. In fact, that was already observed in literature. This is the book by Stefan Dempe, the book on uh, bilevel optimizations. They are very instructive still in this respect. And note that this may prevent then the bare level problem one from having an optimal solution, even if U is compact. That's why we regularize. We regularize, we do, we say, well, we replace, we give a little, we give a little margin either that we hatch with a positive constant. And this results in a modified upper level problem. You have it's not pretty much the same as before you, but you have this perturbed, this eta, this eta set here, this eta, this gives you a bit, a bit space and gives you, gives you the necessary flexibility to avoid discontinuity. And uh, then be lower semi continuous. That means lower semi continuous and compact sets means soluble. It's well defined. Mm -hmm. Six is so whenever you is non empty and compact. So, so Cassie extension. The leader's decision, you is subject to a random perturbation. We have a, we let a, a, random, we have a random vector and a, a, say a parametrized family of uh, random vectors. We will see. We have the leader decision, you. A realization of this uh, y, whatever, and the follower decides the forces, yeah, the one the, the who are the, the, the producers, and that's the test engineer who gives it the max he tries to, to be as nasty as possible, and that might be the nastiest possibility shall be as good as possible from the first stage. Mm, yeah, randomness results from manufacturing errors and has the following effect. Uh, throughout Einstein's dry, the leader's decision is replaced with a perturbed material vector. We have a material vector. And now we multiply the individual components of this material vectors with a, a random, with, with random values. The leader seeks to ensure that the resulting material parameters are feasible regardless of the realization of the random. In order for the perturbed material vector to be almost surely admissible, the leader has to choose the design parameter u in the induced feasible set. So we have a design vector parameter that's again multiplied that's the component by component, influenced by the randomness. This has to be done in such a way that they uh, that that they that they are uh, in the support. That for the support, we are in the feasible set u. And this is be written in a way that uh, we consider the, the image measure u of epsilon and the induced product probability measure. And the mapping, now the mapping becomes, uh, yeah, phi of this random object. So the random, the random object. And now we have the, we have the, which was, which was, which was called F or uh, J before. We consider the bilevel stochastic program and make it deterministic of this random f of u, taking expectations or more general, we take risk measures, a monetary risk measure, translation in variant of monotone. And this gives at least some numbers. <laughs> uh, and uh, then this uh, function is the risk function of this as well defined. This gives numbers and it gives nice pictures like this one. So this is the first picture. It is not. The extraterrestrial, if I move upward, looks like the extraterrestrial. It's such a shell. Maybe I'll give this to the one, the other one before here. This is the same shell. And this shows where material has been put in. You also see a, a net, a grid over, over it, over the, the, and all, along the grid, the grid points, the grid points are those where the uh, tracking is uh, taken at. Yeah, the tracking. Uh, selected 
for individual points or for for for, for whole uh, lines here performed by its edges. And you see, if you do this with a random, when you minimize these random functions that I show you, and you get such things that you see where here the where the places where the where the match is uh, minimal is indicated here. So the where it's dark blue is putting its thing. There are two shells. One shell is the one that has to be, and the other one is the one that does produce to be. And this produced one is uh, distance, and the distance shows from the by, by these yellow parts there. Well, here's again, Mr. E.T. So, and here we have a, and this is now a, <laughs> some force. Re re remember this force. This is some material that's brought in. Where is it brought in? It's brought into this structure. You can see this is also the shell. And we have the force coming from, the force coming from in that direction here, produces the maximum uh, damage. And you see, uh, um, you can, when we can, in the original papers, you can zoom in and see how these these red net grid was, is lying on top of the thing. It is sometimes plain completely, sometimes a bit more, but it is the uh, given the the random you given the randomness the criterion is minimized here expectation, and the uh, and also the randomness uh, cannot it does not act arbitrarily it acts on this shapes. As meat, and that's uh, what's uh, calculated here in the end. So this is. I'm at the end of my talk. Um, this is what I reported here is uh, about to uh, appear soon. We hope we have it on our website, also on the website of the of the uh, collaborative research centers. So uh, there you find a thirty pages paper with a lot of details. I only want to give you to interest you. To say, well, we are, we are, we can be risk neutral. We can do risk in the objective, risk in the constraint, and now we can do uh, uh, by level too. Thank you very much. <laughs>